Q. A. While driving his car, ran over B. A visited B at the hospital and offered to pay for his hospitalization expenses. After the filing of the criminal case against A for serious physical injuries through reckless imprudence, A's insurance carrier offered to pay for the injuries and damages suffered by B. The offer was rejected because B considered the amount offered was inadequate. Is the offer by A to pay hospitalization expenses of B admissible in evidence? The offer by A to pay the hospitalization expenses of B is not admissible in evidence to prove his guilt in both civil and criminal cases. Section 27, Number 4, Rule 130. B. Is the offer by A's insurance carrier to pay for the injuries and damages of B admissible in evidence? 1997. No. It is irrelevant. The obligation of the insurance company is based on the contract of insurance and is not admissible in evidence against the accused because it was not offered by the accused but by the insurance company, which is not his agent. Residenter alias Acta Rule Q. Bemble was charged with rape. Bemble's father, Ramil, approached Artemon, the victim's father, during the preliminary investigation and offered one million to a Termon to settle the case. Artemon refused the offer. During trial, the prosecution presented Artemon to testify on Ramil's offer and thereby establish an implied admission of guilt. Is Ramil's offer to settle admissible in evidence? No. The offer to settle not being made by the accused or with his participation is not admissible against him under the rules of res inter alius acta. No implied admission of guilt can be drawn from efforts to settle a criminal case out of court where the accused had no participation in such negotiation. People versus Godoy. B. During the pre-trial, Bimble personally offered to settle the case for one million to the private prosecutor, who immediately put the offer on record in the presence of the trial judge. Is Bimble's offer a judicial admission of his guilt to Townsend and eight? No. The offer is not a judicial admission of guilt because it has not been reduced in writing or signed by the accused. The rule on pre-trial in criminal case, cases, Section 2, Rule 118, requires that all agreements or admissions made or entered during the pre-trial conference shall be reduced in writing and signed by the accused and counsel. Otherwise, they cannot be used against the accused. What are the requirements in order that an admission of guilt of an accused during a custodial investigation be admitted in evidence 2006 an admission of guilt during a custodial investigation is a confession to be admissible in evidence the requirements are one the confession must be voluntary two the confession must be made with the assistance of competent and independent counsel three the confession must be expressed and four the confession must be in writing people versus Principe. Q. If the accused on the witness stand repeats his earlier in uncounseled extrajudicial confession implicating his co accused in the crime charge, is that testimony admissible in evidence against the latter? 1998. Yes. The accused can testify by repeating his earlier uncounseled extrajudicial confession because he can be subjected to cross examination. Q. What is the probative value of a witness affidavit of recantation, 1998? On the probative value of an affidavit of recantation, courts look with disfavor upon recantations because they can easily be secured from witnesses, usually through intimidation or for a monetary consideration. Recanted testimony is exceedingly unreliable. There is always the probability that it will be repudiated. Molina v. Pipa Q. X and Y were charged with murder. Upon application of the prosecution, Y was discharged from the information to be utilized as a state witness. The prosecutor presented Y as witness but forgot to state the purpose of his testimony, much less offer it in evidence. Y testified that he and X conspired to kill the victim, but it was X who actually shot the victim. The testimony of Y was the only material evidence establishing the guilt of X. 
Why was Torley cross-examined by the defense counsel? After the prosecution rested its case, the defense filed a motion for demur to evidence based on the following grounds. The testimony of Y should be excluded because its purpose was not initially stated and it was not formally offered in evidence as required by Section 34, Rule 132 of the Rules of Evidence, and 2. Y's testimony is not admissible against X pursuant to the rule on res inter alius acta, which means a matter between others is not our business. Rule on the motion for demur to evidence on the above ground, 2003. A. The demur to evidence should be denied because 1. The testimony of Y should not be excluded because the defense counsel did not object to his testimony despite the fact that the prosecutor forgot to state its purpose or offer it in evidence. Moreover, the defense counsel thoroughly cross-examined Y and thus waived the objection. Number 2. The res inter alius acta rule does not apply because Y testified in open court and was subjected to cross-examination. Q. Arrested in a bypass operation, Edmund was brought to the police station where he was informed of his constitutional rights. During the investigation, Edmund refused to give an statement. However, the arresting officer asked Edmond to acknowledge in writing that six sachets of shabu were confiscated from him. Edmond consented and also signed a receipt for the amount of 3000 allegedly representing the purchase price of the shabu. At the trial, the arresting officer testified and identified the documents executed and signed by Edmond. Edmond's lawyer did not object to the testimony. After the presentation of the testimonial evidence, the prosecutor made a formal offer of evidence which included the documents signed by Edmund. Edmund's lawyer objected to the admissibility of the documents for being the fruit of the poisoned tree. Resolved objection with reasons, 2009. The objection to the admissibility of the documents, which the arresting officer asked Edmund to sign without the benefit of counsel, is well taken. Said documents, having been signed by the accused while under custodial investigation, imply an admission without the benefit of counsel that the Bitshabu came from him and that the 3000 was received by him pursuant to the illegal selling of the drugs. Thus, it was obtained by the arresting officer in clear violation of Section 12. Number 3. Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution, particularly the right to be assisted by the counsel during custodial investigation. Moreover, the objection to the admissibility of the evidence was timely made when the same is formally offered. Hearsay Rule Exceptions Q. Distinguished clearly but briefly between hearsay evidence and opinion evidence 2004. Hearsay evidence consists of testimony that is not based on personal knowledge of the person testifying. See Section 36, Rule 130. While opinion evidence is expert evidence based on the personal knowledge, skill, experience, or training of the person testifying. Section 49. The evidence of an ordinary witness on limited matters. Section 50. What are the exceptions to the hearsay rule? 1999. The exceptions to the hearsay rule are dying declaration, declaration against interest, act or declaration about pedigree, family reputation, or traditional regarding pedigree, common reputation, part of the rest juste, interest in the course of business, entries in official records, commercial lists, and the like, learned treatises, and testimony or deposition at a former proceeding. Sections 37 to 47, Rule 130. Q. A foreign dog trained to sniff dangerous drugs from packages was hired by FDP Corporation, a door-to-door -door forwarder company, to sniff packages in their depot at the international airport. In one of the routinary inspections of packages waiting to be sent to the United States of America, the dog sat beside one of the packages, a signal that the package contained dangerous drugs. Thereafter, the guards opened the package and found two kilograms of cocaine. The owner objected of the package, was arrested and charged 
were filed against him. During the trial, the prosecution through the trainer who was present during the incident and an expert in this kind of field testified that the dog was highly trained to sniff packages to determine if the contents were dangerous drugs and the sniffing technique of their highly trained dogs was accepted worldwide and had been successful in dangerous drugs operations. The prosecution moved to admit this evidence to justify the opening of the package. The accused objected on the grounds that 1. The guards had no personal knowledge of the contents of the package before it was opened. 2. The testimony of the trainer of the dog is hearsay. And 3. The accused could not cross-examine the dog. 2014. The objections of the accused should be overruled. An evidence is admissible when it is relevant to the issue and is not excluded by the law or the rules, Section 3, Rule 128. Under Section 36, Rules 130 of the Rules of Court, a witness can testify only to those which he knows of his personal knowledge and derived from his own perception. The contention that the guards had no personal knowledge of the contents of the package before it was opened is without merit. The guards can testify as to the facts surround the opening of the package since they have personal knowledge of the circumstances thereof, being physically present at the time of its discovery. On the other hand, the testimony of the trainer of the dog is not hearsay based on the following grounds. A. He has personal knowledge of the facts in issue, having witnessed the same. B. Hearsay merely contemplates an out-of-court declaration of a person which is being offered to prove the truthfulness and veracity of the facts asserted therein. C. He is an expert witness, hence his testimony may constitute an exception to the hearsay rule. D. The accused has the opportunity to cross-examine him. And E. Testimony of a witness as to statements made by non-human declarants does not violate the rule against hearsay. The law permits the so-called non-human evidence on the ground that machines and animals, unlike humans, lack a conscious motivation to tell falsehood, and because the workings of machines can be explained by human witnesses, who are then subject to cross-examination by opposing counsel. Conversely, the accused may not argue that he cannot cross-examine the dog, as the constitutional right to confrontation refers only to witnesses. As alluded, the human witnesses who have explained the workings of the non-human evidence is the one that should be cross-examined. Hence, the contention of the accused that the he could not cross-examine the dog is misplaced. Ergo, there is no doubt that the evidence of the prosecution is admissible for being relevant and competent. Dying Declaration Q. Requisites of Dying Declaration 1998 The requisites for the admissibility of a dying declaration are A. The declaration is made by the deceased under the consciousness of his impending death. B. The deceased was at the time competent as a witness. C. The declaration concerns the cause and surrounding circumstances of the declarant's death. And D. The declaration is offered in a criminal case wherein the declarant's death is the subject of inquiry. People versus Santos. Q. Romeo is sued for damages for injuries suffered by the plaintiff in a vehicular accident. Julieta, a witness in court, testifies that Romeo told her that he, Romeo, heard Antonio, a witness to the accident, give an excited account of the accident immediately after its occurrence. Is Julieta's testimony admissible against Romeo over proper and timely objection? 2002. No. Julieta's testimony is not admissible against Romeo because while the excited account of Antonio a witness to the accident was told to Romeo, it was only Romeo who told Juliet about it, which makes it hearsay. Q. Maximo filed an action against Pedro, the administrator of the estate of deceased Juan, for the recovery of a car which is part of the latter's estate. During the trial, Maximo presented witness Mariano, who testified that he was present when Maximo and Juan agreed that the latter would pay a rental of 20000 for the use of Maximo's car for one month, after which Juan should immediately return the car to Maximo. Pedro objected to the admission of Mariano's testimony. If you were the judge, would you sustain Pedro's objection? Why? 
Answer, no. The testimony is admissible in evidence because witness Mariano, who testified as to what Maximo and Juan, the deceased person agreed upon, is not disqualified to testify on the agreement. Those disqualified are parties or assigners of the parties to a case or person in whose behalf a case is prosecuted against the administrator or Juan's estate upon a claim or demand against his estate or to any matter of fact occurring before Juan's death. Section 23, Rule 130. Q. The accused was charged with robbery and homicide. The victim suffered several stab wounds. It appears that 11 hours after the crime, while the victim was being brought to the hospital in a jeep with his brother and a policeman as companions, the victim was asked certain questions, which he answered, pointing to the accused as his assailant. His answers were put down in writing, but since he was in a critical condition, his brother and the policeman signed the statement. Is the statement admissible as a dying declaration, 1999? Yes. The statement is admissible as a dying declaration of the victim subsequently dies, and his answers were made under the consciousness of impending death. Section 37, Rule 130. The fact that he did not sign the statement point to the accused as his assailant because he was in critical condition does not affect its admissibility as a dying declaration. A dying declaration need not be in writing. People vs. Vio Vicente, February 2, 1998. Family Reputation or traditional regarding pedigree. Q. Linda and spouses Arnulfo and Regina Ceres were co-owners of a parcel of land. Linda died intestate and without any issue. Ten persons headed by Jocelyn, claiming to be the collateral relatives of the deceased Linda, filed an action for partition with the RTC, praying for the segregation of Linda's one-half share, submitting in support for their petition the baptismal certificates of seven of the petitioners, a family Bible belonging to Linda in which the names of the petitioners have been entered, a photocopy of the birth certificate of Jocelyn, and a certification of the local civil register that its office had been completely razed by fire. The spouses Sarah's refused partition on the following grounds. 1. The baptismal certificates of the parish priest are evidence only of the administration of the sacrament of the baptism and do not prove filiation of the alleged collateral relatives of the deceased. Number two, entry in the family Bible is hearsay. Number three, the certification of the register on non-availability of the records of birth does not prove filiation. Four, in partition case where filiation to the deceased is in dispute, prior and separate judicial declaration of earship in a settlement of estate proceedings is necessary. And five, there is need for publication as real property is involved. As counsel for Jocelyn and her co-petitioners argue against the objections of the spouses Sarah's, so as to convince the court to allow the partition, discuss each of the five arguments briefly but completely. 2000. The baptismal certificate can show the filiation or proof pedigree it is one of the other means allowed under the rules of court and special laws to show pedigree. Trinidad versus Court of Appeals. Number two, entries in the family Bible may be received as evidence of pedigree. Section 40, Rule 130. Number three, the certification by civil register of the non-availability of records is needed to justify the presentation of secondary evidence which is the photocopy of the birth certificate of Jocelyn, ears of Ignacio Conti versus Court of Appeals. Number four, declaration of heirship in a settlement proceeding is not necessary. It can be made in the ordinary action for partition wherein the ears are exercising the right pertaining to the dissident, their predecessor in interest to ask for partition as co-owners. Number five, even if real property is involved, no publication is necessary because what is sought is the mere segregation of Linda's share in the property. Section 1, Rule 69. Part of the res gestae. Res gestae, according to the dictionary, means the events, circumstances, remarks, which relate to a particular case, especially as constituting admissible evidence in a court of law. Q. 
Densho barged into the house of Marcella, tied her to a chair and robbed her of assorted pieces of jewelry and money. Densho then brought Candida, Marcella's maid, to a bedroom where he raped her. Marcella could hear Candida crying and pleading. Huag maawaka sa akin after raping Candida, Densho fled from the house with loot. Candida then untied Marcella and rushed to the police station about a kilometer away and told police officer Roberto Maawa that Densho had barged in to the house of Marcella, tied the latter to a chair, and robbed her of her jewelry and money. Candida also related to the police officer that despite her pleas, Densho had raped her. The policeman noticed that Candida was hysterical and on the verge of collapse. Densho was charged with robbery with rape. During the trial, Candida can no longer be located. If the prosecutor presents police officer Roberto Maawa to testify on what Candida had told him, would such testimony of the policeman be hearsay? 1999. No. The testimony of the policeman is not hearsay. It is a part of the rest is tie. It is also an independently relevant statement. The police officer testified his own personal knowledge, not to the truth of Candida's statement that she told him, despite her pleas, Densho has raped her, People v. Gaddi. b. If the police officer will testify that he noticed Candida to be hysterical and on the verge of collapse, would such testimony be considered as opinion, hence inadmissible, 2005? No. It cannot be considered as an opinion, because he was testifying on what he actually observed. The last paragraph of Section 50, Rule 130, Revised Rules of Evidence, expressly provides that a witness may testify on his impressions of the emotion, behavior, condition, or appearance of a person. Q. While passing by a dark, uninhabited part of their barangay, PO2 Asintado observed shadows and heard screams from a distance. PO2 Asintado hid himself behind the bushes and saw a man beating a woman whom he recognized as his neighbor, Kulasa. When Kulasa was already in agony, the man stabbed her, and she fell on the ground. The man hurriedly left thereafter. Pio II Asintado immediately went to Kulasa's rescue. Kulasa, who was then in the state of hysteria, kept mentioning to Pio II Asintado, Si Rene, gusto akong patayin, sinaksak niya ako. When Pio II Asintado was about to cure her, Kulasa refused and said, Kaya ho, mababaw lang to, habilin mo si Rene. The following day, Rene learned of Colossus' death and, bothered by his conscience, surrendered to the authorities with his counsel. As his surrender was broadcasted all over media, Rene opted to release his statement to the press, which goes, I believe that I am entitled to the presumption of innocence until my guilt is proven beyond reasonable doubt. Although I admit that I perform acts that may take one's life away, I hope and pray that justice will be served in the right way. God bless us all. Signed, Rene. The trial court convicted Rene of homicide on the basis of P.O. 2 Asintado's testimony, Colossus' statements, and Rene's statement to the press. On appeal, Rene raises the following errors. A. The trial court erred in giving weight to P.O. 2 Asintado's testimony, as the latter did not have personal knowledge of the facts in issue, and violated Rene's right to due process when it considered Colossus' statement despite lack of opportunity for her cross-examination. The trial court did not err in giving weight to P.O. to Asintado's testimony. While a witness can only testify as to those facts which he has personal knowledge, the rules provide that a statement made under the influence of a startling event, witnessed by the person who made the declaration before he had time to think and make up a story, or to concoct or contrive a falsehood or to fabricate an account and without any undue influence in obtaining it. Aside from referring to the event in question or its immediate attending circumstances is an exception being part of res gestai. Belbis Jr. v. People, November 14, 2012. In the case, the statements made by P.O. to us in title constitutes part of res gestai since the same were made without any opportunity to fabricate 
and why a startling occurrence was actually taking place. In addition, the statement of Pio II Asentado may fall within the purview of the doctrine of independent relevant statement, where only the fact that such statements were made is relevant, and the truth and falsity thereof is immaterial. People versus Malibiran, April 24, 2009. On the other hand, Colossus statements are also admissible as part of res gestae, since the same were made under the influence of a startling event and without any opportunity to concoct or devise a falsehood. B. The trial court erred in holding that René's statement to the press was a confession which, standing alone, would be sufficient to warrant a conviction. Resolve 2014. The trial court did not err in holding that René's statement to the press is a confession. René's confession to the media were properly admitted because statements spontaneously made by a suspect to news reporters on a television interview are deemed voluntary and are admissible in evidence. People vs. Hippona, February 18, 2010. Entries in official records. Q. X was charged with robbery. On the strength of a warrant of arrest issued by the court, X was arrested by police operatives. They seized from his person a handgun. A charge for illegal possession of firearm was also filed against him. In a press conference called by the police, X admitted that he had robbed the victim of jewelry valued at 500000 The robbery and illegal possession of firearm cases were tried jointly. The prosecution presented in evidence a newspaper clipping of the report to the reporter who was present during the press conference stating that X admitted the robbery. It likewise presented a certification of the PNP firearms an explosive office attesting that the accused had no license to carry any firearm. The certifying officer, however, was not presented as a witness. Both pieces of evidence were objected to by the defense. Is the newspaper clipping admissible in evidence against X? Yes, the newspaper clipping is admissible in evidence against X, regardless of the truth or falsity of a statement. The hearsay rule does not apply and the statement may be shown where the fact that it is made relevant. Evidence as to making of such a statement is not secondary but primary, for the statement itself may constitute a fact in issue or be circumstantially relevant as to the existence of such fact. Gotesco Investment Corporation v. Chato, June 16, 1992. B. Is the certification of the PNP firearm and explosive office without the certifying officer testifying on it, admissible in evidence against X? 2003. Yes, the certification is admissible in evidence against X because a written statement signed by an officer having the custody of an official record or by his deputy that after diligent search, no record or entry of a specified tenor is found to exist in the records of his office accompanied by certificate as above provided, is admissible as evidence that the record of his office contained no such record of entry. Section 28, Rule 132. Opinion Rule. Q. At Nolan's trial for possession and use of the prohibited drugs, known as Shabu, his girlfriend, Kim, testified that on a particular day, she would see Nolan very prim and proper, alert and sharp, but that three days after, he would appear haggard, tired, and overly nervous at the slightest sound he would hear. Nolan objects to the admissibility of Kim's testimony on the ground that Kim merely stated her opinion without having been first qualified as expert witness. Should you, as a judge, exclude the testimony of Kim, 1994? No, the testimony of Kim should not be excluded. Even though Kim is not an expert witness, Kim may testify on her impressions of the emotion, behavior, condition, or appearance of a person. Section 50, last paragraph, Rule 130. Character Evidence D. Was prosecuted for homicide for allegedly beating up B to death with an iron pipe. 
May the prosecution introduce evidence that B had a good reputation for peacefulness and nonviolence. Why? The prosecution may introduce evidence of the good or even bad moral character of the victim if it tends to establish in any reasonable degree the probability or improbability of the offense charge. Section 51, letter A, number 3, rule 130. In this case, the evidence is not relevant. B. May D introduce evidence of specific violent acts by B. Y. 2002. Yes, D may introduce evidence of specific violent acts by V. Evidence that one did or did not do a certain thing at one time is not admissible to prove that he did or did not do the same or a similar thing at another time. But it may be received to prove a specific intent or knowledge, identity, plan, system, scheme, habit, custom, or usage, and the like. Section 34, Rule 130. Q. In a prosecution for murder, the prosecutor asks accused Darwin if he had been previously arrested for violation of Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. As defense counsel, you object. The trial court asked you on what ground. Respond, 2010. The objection is on the ground that the fact sought to be elicited by the prosecution is irrelevant and immaterial to the offense under prosecution and trial. Moreover, the rules do not allow the prosecution to adduce evidence of bad moral character of the accused pertinent to the offense charge, except on rebuttal and only if it involves a prior conviction by final judgment. Section 51, Rule 130. Offer an Objection. What are the two kinds of objections? Explain each briefly. 1997. Two kinds of objections are 1. The evidence being presented is not relevant to the issue. And 2. The evidence is incompetent or excluded by the law or the rules. Section 3. Rule 138. An example of the first is when the prosecution offers as evidence the alleged offer of an insurance company to pay for the damages suffered by the victim in a homicide case. Examples of the second are evidence obtained in violation of the constitutional prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizure and confessions and admissions in violation of the rights of a person under custodial investigation. Q. A trial court cannot take into consideration in deciding a case an evidence that has not been formally offered. When are the following pieces of evidence formally offered? 1994-1997 Testimonial Evidence Testimonial evidence is formally offered at the time the witness is called to testify. Section 35, first paragraph, 132. Rule B. Documentary Evidence Documentary evidence is formally offered after the presentation of the testimonial evidence. Section 35, second paragraph, Rule 132. Object evidence. The same is true with object evidence. It is also offered after the presentation of the testimonial evidence. Q. Counsel A objected to a question posed by opposing counsel B on the grounds that it was hearsay and it assumed a fact not yet established. The judge banged his gavel and ruled by saying, Objection sustained. Can counsel B ask for a reconsideration of the ruling? 2012. Yes. Counsel B may ask the judge to specify the grounds relied upon for sustaining the objection and thereafter move its reconsideration thereof. Section 38, Rule 132. Revised Rules and Summary Procedure. Prohibited Pleadings and Motions. Q. Charge with the offense of slight physical injuries under an information duly filed with the METC in Manila which, in the meantime, had duly issued an order declaring that the case shall be governed by the revised rules and summary procedure, the accused filed with said court a motion to quash on the sole ground that the officer who filed the information had no authority to do so. The METC denied the motion on the ground that it is a prohibited motion under the said rule. The accused thereupon filed with the RTC in Manila a petition for certiorari in some assailing and seeking the nullification of the METC's denial of his motion to quash. 
the RTC in due time issued an order on the ground that it is not allowed by the said rule. The accused forthwith filed with the RTC a motion for reconsideration of its said order. The RTC in time denied said motion for reconsideration on the ground that the same is also a prohibited motion under the said rule. Where the RTC's orders denying due course to the petition as well as denying the motion for reconsideration correct? 2004. The RTC's orders denying due course to the petition for certiorari as well as denying the motion for reconsideration are both not correct. The petition for certiorari is a prohibited pleading under Section 19, letter G of the revised Rule on Summary Procedure, and the motion for reconsideration while it is not prohibited motion, Lucas v. Fabros, should be denied because the petition for certiorari is a prohibited pleading. Rules of Procedure for Environmental Cases Q. What do you understand about the precautionary principle under the Rules of Procedure for Environmental Cases 2012? Precautionary principle states that when human activities may lead to threats of serious and irreversible damage to the environment that is scientifically plausible but uncertain, actions shall be taken to avoid or diminish that threat. In its essence, the precautionary principle calls for the exercise of caution in the face of risk and uncertainty. Section 4, letter F, Rule 1, Part 1, and Rule 20, AM number 09-6-8-SC, Rules of Procedure for Environmental Cases. Read of Continuing Mandamus. Hannibal, Donna, Florence, and Joel concerned residents of Laguna de Bay filed a complaint of mandamus against the Laguna Lake Development Authority, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the Department of Public Works and Highways, Department of Interior and Local Government, Department of Agriculture, Department of Budget and Philippine National Police before the RTC of Laguna, alleging that the continued neglect of defendants in performing their duties has resulted in serious deterioration of the water quality of the lake, and the degradation of the marine life in the lake. The plaintiffs pray that said government agencies be ordered to clean up Laguna de Bay and restore its water quality to Class C, waters as prescribed by Presidential Decree 1151, otherwise known as the Philippine Environment Code. Defendants raise the defense that the cleanup of the lake is not a ministerial function and they cannot be compelled by mandamus to perform the same. The RTC of Laguna rendered a decision declaring that it is the duty of the agency to clean up Laguna de Bay and issued a permanent writ of mandamus, ordering said agencies to perform their duties prescribed by law relating to the cleanup of Laguna de Bay. A. Is the RTC correct in issuing the writ of mandamus? E. What is the rate of continuing mandamus 2016 bar? Answer. Yes, the RTC is correct in issuing the rate of mandamus. Generally, the rate of mandamus lies to require the execution of a ministerial duty while the implementation of the government agency's mandated tasks may entail a decision-making process, the enforcement of the law, or the very act of doing what the law exacts to be done in its ministerial in nature, and may be compelled by mandamus. Hence, the duty to clean up Laguna Lake and restore its water quality to Class C is required not only by Presidential Decree Number 1152, otherwise known as the Philippine Environment Code, but also in its charter. It is thus ministerial in nature and can be compelled by mandamus. Accordingly, the RTC may issue a writ of continuing mandamus directing any agency or instrumentality of the government or officer thereof to perform the act or series of acts decreed by final judgment which shall remain effective until the judgment is fully satisfied. Metropolitan Manila Development Authority versus Concerned Residents of Manila de Bay. B. A writ of continuing mandamus is a writ issued when any agency or instrumentality of the government or officer thereof unlawfully neglects the performance of an act which the law specifically enjoins as a duty resulting from an office, trust, or station in connection 
with the enforcement or violation of an environmental law. Rule or regulation or a right therein or unlawfully excludes another from the use or enjoyment of such right and there is no other plain, speedy, and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. The person aggrieved thereby may file a verified petition in the proper court, alleging the facts with certainty attaching thereto supporting evidence, specifying that the petition concerns an environmental law, rule or regulation and praying that the judgment be rendered, commanding the respondents to do an act or series of acts until the judgment is fully satisfied, and to pay damages sustained by the petitioner by reason of malicious neglect to perform the duties of the respondent under the law, rules or regulations. The petition shall also contain a sworn certification of non-form shopping. A writ of continuing mandamus is a writ issued by a court in an environmental case directing any agency or instrumentality of the government or officer thereof to perform an act or series of acts decreed by final judgment which shall remain effective until judgment is fully satisfied. Section 7, Rule 8, AM, Number 09-6, Dash eight dash SC, also known as Rules of Procedure for Environmental Cases. Writ of Kalikasan Q. The officer of Ankapaligiran I Alagaan, Incorporated, engaged your services to file an action against ABC Mining Corporation, which is engaged in mining operations in Santa Cruz, Marindoki. ABC used highly toxic chemicals in extracting coal. ABC's toxic mine tailings were accidentally released from its storage dams and were discharged into the river of said town. The mine tailings found their way to Kalankan Bay, allegedly to the waters of nearby Romblon and Kasson. The damage to the crops and loss of earnings were estimated at one billion. Damage to the environment is estimated at one billion. As a lawyer for the organization, you are requested to explain the advantage derived from a petition for writ of Kalikasan before the Supreme Court over a complaint for damages, before the RTC of Marinduque, or vice versa. What action will you recommend? 2016. As a lawyer for the organization, I would recommend the filing of a petition for issuance of a writ of Kalikasan. The writ of Kalikasan is a remedy available to a natural or juridical person entity authorized by law, people's organization, non-governmental organization, or any public interest group accredited by or registered with any government agency on behalf of persons whose constitutional right to a balanced and health for ecology is violated or threatened with violation by an unlawful act or omission of a public official or employee or private individual or entity involving environmental damage of such magnitude as to prejudice the life, health, or property of inhabitants in two or more cities or provinces. Section 1 of Rule 7 of the Rules of Procedure for Environmental Case. The following reliefs may be included under the writ of Kalikasen. A. Directing respondent to permanently cease and desist from committing acts or neglecting the performance of duty in violation of environmental laws resulting in environmental destruction or damage. B. Directing the respondent, public official, government agency, private person or entity to protect, preserve, rehabilitate, or restore the environment. C. Directing the respondent, public official, government agency, private person or entity to monitor strict compliance with the decision and orders of the court. D. Directing the respondent, public official, government agency, or private person or entity to make periodic reports on the execution of the final judgment and e such other reliefs which relate to the right of the people to a balanced and helpful ecology or to the protection preservation rehabilitation or restoration of the environment except the award of damages to individual petitioner section 15 rule 7 the rules also provide interim reliefs in favor of the petitioner upon filing a verified motion, namely a. Ocular inspection b. Production or inspection of documents or things Section 12, Rule 7 
Additionally, the petition for writ of Kalikasan is more advantageous compared to a complaint for damages before the RTC because it may be filed directly with the Supreme Court or with any of the stations of the Court of Appeals. Unlike a complaint for damages before the RTC, which only be filed by a real party in interest as defined in Rule 3, Number 2 of the Rules of Court, the rule on locus standi is relaxed in petitions for writ of Kalikasan, which allows the petition to be filed by parties as citizens suit. In addition, any of the following may file a petition for writ of Kalikasan, a natural or juridical person, b. Entity authorized by law, or c. POs, NGOs, or any public interest group accredited by or registered with any government agency on behalf of persons whose constitutional right to a balanced and healthful ecology is violated. Section 1, Rule 7. Besides, the petition for writ of Kalikasan is exempted from the payment of docket fees. From the foregoing, it is clear that filing a petition for writ of Kalikasan would be the best remedy to address all the environmental problems caused by the release of the toxic waste to the waters of Fromblon and Kesson without the burden of paying docket fees. After all, the filing of a petition for the issuance of writ of Kalikasan shall not preclude the filing of separate civil, criminal, or administrative actions. Thus, the organization can later file a complaint for damages with the original trial court should they decide to do so. At any rate, the rules provide that judgment must be rendered within 60 days from the time the petition is submitted for decision, which expedites the proceedings significantly considering the urgency of situation in the instant case. As lawyer for the organization, I would recommend, therefore, the filing of a petition for a writ of Kalikasan with the Supreme Court.